please understand that it's complicated because sibling fighting is really all about humans resolving conflicts. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know about you. Like, are you are you amazing at conflict resolution in your own life? No. I mean, I've definitely improved in the last five. I think I was horrible, like F, D minus, like five years ago. But I, I, I would give myself like a B plus now. But, but I also, yeah. I think it's about conflict resolution, but I also think it's about the family culture. And I think that it's, and I think the reason why it's hard to start there is because it speaks to the, I don't want to use the word rules, but the like overarching principles of the way the, the family is run. My name is Randy Rubenstein, and welcome to the Mastermind Parenting Podcast. At Mastermind Parenting, we're on a mission to support strong-willed kids and the families that love them. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Can't you tell that I listen to podcasts way too much because that is literally the way Dax Shepard opens, I think, every armchair expert. And I haven't even listened to that podcast in a long time. Anyway, hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode. This is going to be another two-parter with my new, I don't want to call her bestie because I think it's like a, you know, when you become friends with someone, but like you're a little bit worried that you might like them more than they like you. That's what's going on with me and Michaeline Duclef. I'm obsessed with her. <laughs> and I, yes, I do tend to get obsessed with People, people that I believe, people that are authentic, people that are the opposite of, of these, you know, someone who stands for perfectionism and performative, like she's so real. She's teaching me things. I'm just loving my conversations with her so much. And, um, Lindsay, who works with me, who's my coworker and she, I don't ever listen to any of these podcasts because I think I would just, I don't know, get sick of myself. And and so I just don't. I just want to be authentic with you guys. And so I don't listen to these episodes back, but Lindsay listens to everything. It goes through a whole channel with my podcast producer and Lindsay, my coworker, she listens to everything I record in all my groups, all my podcast, because I have a private podcast too. And, and so God bless Lindsay. She listens to everything. So Lindsay, she listened to this two-part episode, this conversation with me and Michaeline. And she usually waits for the podcast producer to send it to her for her to listen to. But Lindsay knew I had recorded it and she went behind the scenes and she listened to it before it even went to anyone else because she was so excited. She's like, I, I can't get enough of these conversations. And so she couldn't wait for like the next week when they sent it to her. And so she listened to it like the day after. And I thought it was weird because she was giving me feedback. She was like sending me messages. Oh, I loved this part and I love that part. And once the conversation's done, I don't remember all of it. So I didn't even know exactly what she was talking about. So my introduction to this two-part episode, all about sibling rivalry and sibling fighting, and we talk about lots of different things. Um, that's our main topic. Lindsay said she did not want it to end, that she learned some things. And she's been, she's been my coworker for six years. She's listened to so much. I mean, literally she sometimes can teach the concepts that I teach better than I can, but she felt like she was learning new information and new content. So this is part one of my conversation with Michaeline Duclef, the, the author of Hunt, Gather, Parent. I don't know why I'm tripping over that. I've only said it a million times at this point. Hold on to your seats because I think this is a really good one. Enjoy. Okay, I am here once again with Michaeline Duclef, and we, the topic today is sibling fighting, sibling fighting. Um, how do you feel about this topic? <laughs> Me? Oh, I'm excited because I've, I've wanted to write, I wanted a chapter in, in Hunt Gather Parent about this topic, but I ended up just not having time and the book was already too long. And so, but, so I'm super excited. I mean, everybody asks me this, right? There's like 
three questions everybody asks, and this is definitely one of them. So I'm excited to talk about it. I think it's great. Uh, when people start, when people come in to my programs and they immediately start asking about the sibling stuff, I'm kind of like, oh, because I know it's complicated mm. and it is. I know I know it's complicated and I know at the very beginning, it's almost like I want to say like, okay, I know this is the hottest topic right now for you. And also, please understand that it's complicated because sibling fighting is really all about humans resolving conflicts. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know about you. Like, are you, are you amazing? at conflict resolution in your own life? No. I mean, I've definitely improved in the last five. I think I was horrible, like F, D minus, like five years ago. But I, I, I would give myself like a B plus now. But, but I also, yeah. I think it's about conflict resolution, but I also think it's about the family culture. And I think that it's, and I think the reason why it's hard to start there is because it speaks to the I don't want to use the word rules, but the like overarching principles of the way the, the family is run. And I think if, if you start to shift those and maybe through like sibling rivalry and working on sibling rivalry, you can shift those. But when you start to shift the, the family culture, the rules, the expectations, what's you know, tolerated and what's not and how we think of each other and each other's roles in our lives, then I think a, a lot of the sibling rivalry resolves. And I, that's what I saw when I was traveling was that the families and the parents had a culture that almost just wasn't conducive to sibling rivalry. In fact, it was the other. It was fostering and creating sibling cooperation, which clearly stems from parent-child cooperation, right? So that's why maybe why it's hard to start there, because if the parent isn't cooperating with the child, then you can't expect the children to cooperate. But once you start fostering this culture of cooperation versus competition, then what I saw is that this, this isn't a problem in many parts of the world. I, so I know true. that sounds crazy, but, but like, it's just not like one of the researchers in the Maya village, the first time I went down to the Yucatan said to me, well, the kids just don't fight. And I was like, okay, I have been on tape. I'm like, okay, they clearly fight because all kids fight. And she's like, no, they just don't fight. Not, they just don't do it. And I was just like, well, well, why? And then I started to learn it's because, you know, there's this whole other way of the parent treating the child, which then gets kind of trickled down to the child treating the other child. Right. You just explained why I get that feeling of dread when people come in and they're like, here's my biggest fire. And, you know, I like to say, I'm going to teach you how to fish. You know, that old mm. proverb of yeah. rather than just giving you fish dinners, I'm going to teach you how to fish and then you can feed yourself for life. Right. right. So when someone comes in with, with the sibling thing, I know that that is a program that I teach that is like five programs down the line of programs and yeah. where they come in, I, you know, they're, they're in my basics program and it's like, okay, let's just put a pin in that sibling thing and let's focus on the basics. Exactly yeah. what you just said, because so much is going to shift in change because your whole family culture is going to shift in change. We're going to, we're going to, to really sort of set a new foundation here. And so by the time you advance to the sibling fighting program, you may find that it's just really not a big issue anymore because yeah. your, your whole, you know, the foundation has been rebuilt. Exactly. I think it's about moving from a controlling competitive culture to moving to a collaborating cooperation culture, right? And um, yeah, I mean, that's what I saw everywhere we went. You know, it, it is is absolutely true. The kids, you know, there are tiffs, you know, but they don't, they, they want to work together with each other and help each other and take responsibility for each other and care about. And I want to say that when we were living in San Francisco, um, 
I saw this, this sibling relationship in some of the communities there. So, I mean, it is absolutely possible in America. It's just, it just, it, it really comes from the parents doing a couple of things differently in it's setting expectations differently. I think on my coaching call yesterday, I was coaching a mom about a sibling issue and she had been processing it on her like accountability in her accountability group separately. And so when I was coaching her on it, um, Lindsay, who, you know, works with me, Lindsay's like, okay, there's a plot twist. I wasn't expecting it to go there because her two kids were fighting. It was actually a really cute fight. Like it was actually freaking adorable, um, which I know it's not adorable when you're in it, but like me as a third party looking at it. So she's got these two kids and they both love reading. And right now her son, who's six, is six, seven, maybe seven, is really into the dog man series. Mm-hmm. And and the and the mom the mom is a pediatrician okay so she like she knows a thing right so the mm-hmm. mom so he she's like i'm not crazy about the dog man series but whatever so he her little boy loves this dog man series and he got the books for his birthday or something and he loves them so much that he wants to share them with other kids at school so he takes them to school but he's devised this library system where other kids can check the books out from him. They give him two pennies. And Aww. then and then when they check the back the book back in, he gives the two pennies back. Mm. Like he came up with this by himself. I okay? love it. I love it. Okay. <laughs> I know. It's okay, wonderful. so 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 older sister, voracious reader, she's nine. In two minutes before it's time to leave, mom and dad both have to get to work. Crazy last two minutes. And she says, I have one of your books in my backpack, one of your dogman books. And the younger brother says, um, I don't want you to take it. I don't want you to take it to school. Mm-hmm. And she says, too bad, so sad. I'm taking it. And digs her heels in. And before you know it, it starts to escalate. Mm-hmm. And because the little boy, the the little boy. He's like, she won't listen to me. She won't hear a word, her, hear my words. And she, she goes to, he goes to ask mom to intervene. So mom intervenes and says, listen, you're going to have to, and she knows older sister can get pretty physical and aggressive with younger mm-hmm. brother. Mm-hmm. And so she does, she's just like, okay, so here's the deal. And older sister's like, yeah, I'm taking them. I don't care. And she starts to like, you know, lose her mind a little bit you know, says Mm. something, you know, I hate you, shut up, whatever, whatever, whatever. It escalates. And then sister grabs the book and smacks brother in the head with the book. Mm. Mm. Okay. So there's the scenario. What are your thoughts? (laughs) So my first thought as you were talking was, I think it's very interesting that they're arguing over property, which is, very common in our society to argue over property. And I think that there's something that I saw everywhere we went is that parents teach children from a very young age, even when it's not it family, right? So even when it's a neighbor or cousin, or when you're with other kids, you don't bring something out. You don't have something, you don't, a toy, a book, whatever, unless it's going to be shared. And I know that this isn't exactly what you're talking about. There's some other things going on here, but I think there's this, I think a lot of conflict that I see with children is over property. And we teach mm. children very young age, what it means to have your property versus my property. And I think this is very important in our society that property and we could talk about this forever. But what I have found and what I've seen is that when children are taught from a very young age and from that, if you have something and it's out and multiple people see it, it is for everybody to share. And if you don't want Mm. that, you have to take it away. You have to go somewhere where there aren't other kids. So one of the things we say is like, if you show it, you share it. Like it's the opposite of what we're taught, right? Show and tell, right? And um, and it comes from this, you know, this idea in indigenous cultures of we're always looking back to the group, 
right? Where it's a very, it's kind of the opposite mm. of individualism, right? And so I, I think that a lot of sibling larvae, a lot of sibling conflict comes from this pro- where we're, we're very defensive of this is yours and this is mine. And this is Bobby's and this is mm. Julie's. And, 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 but at the end of the day, children, especially the family unit, is made to share and use these things um, as, as a family, as a team. And so for me, I would start to rethink a little bit about like, what's the role of property in this, in this family? And like, is there a way of re reassessing and re kind of starting over a little bit and being like, we're going to have a new way of thinking about our prop, our, our individual property. And I mean, this might be really hard and might, might not be the place to start, but like, for the, the things that that we have out in the open and we're and you know the, we're all we're using then we then we share and I think that there's I would start to like re kind of discuss that aspect of it because the ch- the child is using this property as like almost like a tool of conflict and mm-hmm. one of like one of the moms in the Arctic said to me like we would never let a piece of property interfere with our relationships. Mm-hmm. And when she said this, I was like, okay, I let property interfere with my relationship with Rosie like every day, right? That's what else, so much of the conflict is about. You're going to break this. You're going to take this. This is mine. This is yours. And I think it really got me thinking like, you know, what's more important? My relationship with Rosie or the sister's relationship with her brother or her relationship with her mom or this book. And somehow this book has become more important than all three of them. It's so true because older sister who quite often, I have a term, I call it the wronger, the wronger rule. It's based on Larry David. Like, I like, <laughs> do you ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm? Yes. yes. <laughs> so like every single episode is about something, some wrongdoing that happens, but then Larry takes it up a notch and he ultimately becomes wronger. And then all you focus mm. on Larry being wronger because he's so outlandish and ridiculous. But the truth is something wrong happened. He just handled it in a way where he ultimately became wronger. Right? <laughs> like, like, like you double down. On you know, the like he's in, the, he's in the elevator going to his doctor's appointment. And then when the door opens, he lets the woman go out before him and she goes and she signs in instead of letting him sign in first and or say when they call the people on the list, his, even though his appointment came before her, she didn't say, oh, it's okay. You, he was here at the same time as me. I just signed in first. And so she takes his appointment and then it's the end of the day. And the doctor says, well, I ran out of time. Sorry, you're going to have to reschedule your appointment. So he's pissed because he was so polite that he let her out of the elevator and she didn't return the politeness. Right. Right. (laughs) Right? Like, and you're like, well, he kind of has a point. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) he kind of has a point, but he, because he takes it up a notch and because he's so rude and obnoxious, all anyone can focus on is whoever, became the wrong guest. And Mm. so like this sister quite often, like she is the Larry David younger brother is hoarding property. He has a system in place that he's sharing with kids at school and he has been actually sharing with her at home. But now all of a sudden he's going to like, he's going to pull his own weight or, or, or seek power to let her know that they're actually his books. And so he, he sort of trumps her, right? And he's like, well, you can't take them to school. And so then it becomes a power struggle between the two of them over property, right? But he ultimately, right. like little brother was the one that started it. And she unfortunately just Larry David it and became wronger by smacking him upside the head. And, you know. I mean, I, I, I think it, it's it's like, instead of like, okay, how do we resolve this conflict? It's like, why is this a source of conflict? Like, I, I who cares if she has the book? <laughs> you know, I mean, like, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, we put so much emphasis on like, this is my property versus your property. And this is like, that we lose sight of the fact that maybe it doesn't matter at all. And maybe the mom shouldn't really care as much as she does. Or like, 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 she, she's, 
this conflict is being made over something that in a lot of places in the world, it would not be made over. Well, I think what happened, what, when I coached the mom, ultimately what ended up coming out, and this is what they all thought was a plot twist, was that a mom actually came to the conclusion that she was being controlling by even like mm, getting yeah. involved in the way that she did, right? And so then- Yeah, I, I agree you know, with that. Right. So she was like, yeah, I was, I was being controlling. I think I got involved where I really actually didn't really need to get involved. And since the two kids were already power struggling over property, now all of a sudden when mom gets it, gets involved, it sort of like intensified the whole situation. And yeah. then older sister, you know, then it got physical. I think by the mom getting involved, she's almost, she's giving credibility to this idea that this is my property versus your property. I think this would be something I would leave alone. I would, I would, I would not make a big deal about it. I would toss off. And if the younger one is still upset about it later, or even if he's not, I would talk to him about it and be like, look, you know, or even talk to both of them, maybe not at the same time of like, look, we're family. We share our books. You don't, this is not your book. This is, we share our books. So yeah, in many parts of point. the world where the family culture is collaborative and cooperative, everything is shared, almost everything. There isn't this, I have a room full of stuff that's mine. <laughs> that's what I was trying to get at at the beginning. It's like almost everything is shared. And sometimes the children have little things that are theirs, but it's very kept. It's very kind of private. Everything is shared. And I think that mm. this is where you start to get away from some of the sibling rivalry is when you start to say, look, we're family. We share these books. This is not your book. This is the family's book. Your sister can use it. You can use it. You know, um, and, and so I would, I would start to teach that later on, not in that moment of hotness, but that's where I would start to use this uh, need for like, clearly the, 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 the older da the daughter is, is asking for some guidance here, I think. Maybe she's asking to participate in his cool scheme. You know, like at the end of the day, children want to be team members. They want to collaborate. They want to participate. And his, the little brother's got this cool thing going on. Clearly, she doesn't know how to say, like, I want in on this. Can I help? That's what I, you know, but maybe that's what she wants. There's something going on. I would try to figure that out. And I would also use this as an opportunity to remind the children that, like, we share things in this family. That everything is shared. It's really, good. Almost everything. It's good. You know, it, what's interesting is that um, mom ended up taking the books away mm. and because, you know, then when it got physical, it was all intense. And so then dad ended up driving younger brother to school. Mom ended up driving older sister to school. And they just kind of separated them and did it. And mom took the books. Well, then mom found out when she when she, she called her from work and, and talked to her after school. And older sister ended up saying, she's like, so... I ended up going and taking the books back and putting them in my backpack. Mm -hmm. So she comes clean and tells mom, like, like, I mean, she's, she's resourceful and crafty. So she goes and gets the books back, puts them mm -hmm. again in her backpack, takes them to school. In the middle of the day, she was feeling, I think, guilty about it. So she asks her teacher, can I go, I have my brother's books and I actually didn't have permission to take them. Can I actually go and return them to him in his classroom? Mm. I know. Oh. And so then she, go I know. So then she goes and she returns them to her brother in his classroom. And, you know, when we were talking about it and I said, and when you go back, right, like after it's not hot anymore and you, and you have a conversation with each of them, which I, I think this property conversation is really good and really important. Um, but you know, and so I didn't even, I didn't think about this, but I'm going to definitely have the mom listen to this podcast because I think that this is such a valid point. But what I said to the mom was, I was like, I, I think there's something else coming up for her that mm -hmm. like, why did she, because he never would have even known she had the books in her backpack in the first place. Right. So she told right. him. So I was like, 
there's more to the story here. Um, yeah, for it's, sure. yeah. you know, I, I said, I said, I have a feeling she's used to using younger brother as a little bit of a punching bag when, you know, and she's doing this in the last, like the whole morning is smooth. And then two minutes before it's time to go is when a lot of times these fights out of nowhere break out. Well, it mm -hmm. seems like it's mm -hmm. happening on these early mornings when dad takes them to school. And I said, so could she be like happy being at home that she doesn't want to go to school as early as seven o'clock? And mom was like, no, she actually loves getting there early. She loves those early mornings. I was like, okay, so that's not it. Mm. Maybe it's that, she, could she be craving one-on-one -on -one time with dad? Could it be that she, you know, she's using this as a way to fight with brother right before it's time to go. And then quite often what ends up happening is what happened where y'all separate them and you end up driving one and she drives the other. Could it be that she's craving one-on-one -on -one time? And she's like, actually, that would make sense because her and her dad, they have kind of been at odds a lot lately. And mm -hmm. so she might be craving either one-on-one -on -one time with him or for her brother to go, you know, she doesn't know. But I was like, but you won't find out, you know, these are just, we're just kind of like throwing ideas out. Yeah. You're not going to find out until you go and sit with her and get to the root of why she's doing this two minutes before it's time to go, because you know, there's a reason and it probably wasn't even about the books. I mean, and I, I would be like reluctant to automatically assume it's like something devious. <laughs> you know, I think, I, I, I think one of the big problems with sibling rivalry is I think, I think what I have seen around the world is that siblings love to take care of each other. They love to work together. They love, they just as like a young child wants to work together with their parent an older sibling, I know it sounds crazy to a lot of parents, wants no, to be I believe helpful it. and be on the same team and work together with a younger child. It's just it's never been fostered or taught. In fact, the, uh, the right. opposite has been assumed. And so I, I would use this as an opportunity to see if I could get them to work together, you know, on this library thing. Like, do you want to help your brother? Maybe you guys could work together. Like, I see it as her, like, you know, want requesting to be involved in this thing or requesting to mm. be involved like more cooperatively in her brother's life. Like that's how I think a lot of parents around the world would interpret this. I know that sounds crazy, but um, I think we automatically assume they want to compete. They want to be isolated, right? They want alone time. But what if she actually wants the opposite? What if she wants to be involved and do something collaboratively with her brother. Mm -hmm. This is just mm -hmm. like a wild That's speculation, but like, but I, I yeah. think that there's a really interesting study that I wrote about for NPR a couple years ago where it looks at siblings. And I just thought of this for this episode. It looks at how siblings um, collaborate and work together in a very um, set up laboratory um, like experiment. And um, it's it's brothers in, in in brothers and sisters mixed pairs, and it's um, European Americans pairs, and then um, indigenous Mexican uh, in America siblings, and they have this um, this kind of this game they have to do, uh, and then the researchers watch how they do it, and they're told explicitly to work together, and it's so fascinating, Randy, because. The European American siblings, they're about the same age as what you're talking about in this story, don't know how to work together in this uh, experiment, in this game. And you can see it in the videos. You can see it the way that they encoded the game, whereas the indigenous American, the Native American group uh, siblings actually really work together in multiple ways on this task. And I think that it's because the parents have taught them to do this, how to do this, and that mm -hmm. the parents have, have, have collaborated with the children. And so, you know, we automatically go to this thing of like individualism and, and, you know, and, and whereas I, I really think kids, 
siblings, they want to help each other. They want to work together with each other. And if we come at it from that perspective, maybe you'll see it, <laughs> maybe, you know, and maybe it will come, it will come out more. It's interesting because after an argument like that, I think a Maya mom would, would have the two siblings do each other's laundry or something like that. <laughs> like there's always okay. this, like, like if they argue or whatever, then the parents create things that, um, that make them work together or help each other. It, it, that's the punishment, just yeah, helping each yeah. other. <laughs> Well, I think, um, I think a lot of times what we're dealing with and it, that study is so interesting with the European kids because, um, I've had many people who end up going through the sibling, my sibling fighting program where they say, I wish I would have known this, like even from like the very first webinar that they watched, they're like, I wish I would have known this information when I had my second child or my third child mm. because I would have handled it differently. Because one of the things I talk about is that when you bring a new baby into the house, um, it's super important that you're, that the older sibling is a part of the team. So like, yes. like yes. they're, they're getting diapers, they're, they're yes. there with you breastfeeding. You're like, the baby's falling asleep. Get the wet washcloth, you know, yes. gently, gently on the feet. Oh my gosh. They, they see you. Yeah, you're right. You have the, oh my God, you love your older brother so much. Look how lucky yeah. you are. And yes. he didn't have yeah. an older brother. He was the oldest one, but you, you're so lucky little baby to have this amazing person, you know? So I, I talk about that team from the beginning but when you don't have that, when that hasn't been part of the conditioning and from the get-go, it was all of a sudden new baby comes in and 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 Taylor Swift, who used to be giving me a private concert, is now yeah. it, giving you a private concert more of the time than they're giving me a private concert. And it becomes sort of this competitive relationship yes. That's right. early on. And so we've got to Dis I think exactly what you're saying. It's like we have to disrupt that pattern and now foster that team building a little bit later on, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think it it is like a reset in the family. I mean, it really is. Like, I think that that's why you dread it. And like, you know, it's like it, it, fixing this is is kind of a, advanced, you know, because it you kind of have to reset the rules. You have to reset the the expectations of how we treat each other, you know, um, mm -hmm. one of the things in you were talking or you were mentioning in the, in the spreadsheet for this t call is like, you know, siblings talking mean to each other, saying mean things to each other, like arguing, right. And being mean to each other. And like in many, many households around the world, that would be completely unheard of number one, but also untold, not tolerated. Like right. just that would be cut off right away. Like we just don't, we don't talk to family members in a disrespectful way. It doesn't matter if they're two years old, if you're eight years old. One of the huge rules of, of the home is like we treat each other with respect. The family is treating each other with respect. That is number one. And it, and it, and it, and that is, that expectation is set from the beginning. Right. And so the true, I think that that's what you, you have to reset that. You know, I think a lot like my household that I grew up in, my sister was vicious to me, vicious, mean words, shoes thrown at me. I mean, so much, we our my family treated each other worse than they treat strangers, right? I, uh, this yeah. is a very I Western a thing. In many households, yeah. Yeah, like you, you know, like you're, you're arguing and mean and then you smile at the stranger at the street, right? And and this is a very, first of all, a very Western thing. This does this in psychology. This doesn't happen in any other, really, any other society where the family members get treated. Really? Worst. Yes, it's one of the weird things wow. that we do in, in you know, weird psychology. So you know, Western Westerners, Western Europeans, like have these set of weird things that they do in psychology experiments. Wait, will really you talk? Somebody, one of my moms was just talking, was just quoting the weird thing yeah. back to me. And she's like, she's like, maybe this is, I, I, I probably got this from you. I'm like, no, you didn't. You got it from Michaeline and Hunt Gather Parent because she talks all about this. So will you break down the, the weird concept again? 
Yeah, and actually it's a good point because I think it's really a huge part of this reason we have this sibling problem is these weird. So weird is like an acronym for like Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. So it's just some um, psychologist came up with it really to describe Western European culture, right? Not Eastern European, but what the West and then the United States, Australia, you know. Um, so what it is, is if, if you look at a series of psychological experiments that, you know, psychologists like to do uh, questionnaire surveys, these people, Western Europeans, do very strange things and very unique, have very unique behaviors in like a handful of experiments that then if you run in other cultures all around the world, they tend to do more similarly. So we're kind of the, uh, me, I'm Irish, Scottish, so I'm part of the weird, uh, you know, I tend to do uh, these weird things that like the rest of the world doesn't do and you just don't see it. So one of the things is you have this very, very positive, good treatment of strangers at the same time that there's a lot of disrespect within the family. So anywhere else in the world, it's flipped around. The family takes precedent. The family is more important. You know, you respect the family, you take up for the family, um, and then you're more uh, uh, more apprehensive, not as kind to the strangers which I mean, evolutionarily makes more sense, right? Um, and you could see how it could be more conducive to siblings getting along, right? So, so I think what I, what I would try to do is, is, a, is try to reset the expectations of like, look, we are, we are kindest to our family. We are kindest to our siblings, to the people that we live with. And we don't, we don't talk, we don't talk to them that way. We don't talk to them that way. And you don't get angry because, that's going to be a whole nother can of worms, but it's just, it's, it's starting to kind of reset the culture of like respect within the family. And it, and it applies to every, every family member. It's like the family is sacred. You know, Abs I, it's, it's absolutely, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. And the number one, the number one, and like, like, like who, that's who you defend. That's who you take up for. That's who you support. And, you know, I tell Rosie this, I tell her, I say, I have your back. You're back number. You're you're number. You have, you are my number one. No, not your friend down the street. Not the teacher. Not the you know the doctor. It's like you and me. We we have each other's back. And I think that is what kids need to feel this kind of groundedness, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't have this. I I didn't have this at all. I never felt like my parents had my back, and and it made me feel kind of like I'm floating in life a little bit, you know. But I think. The kid knowing that they are supported by their parents, by their siblings, by, you know, number one, no matter what, I think is, 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 is such a powerful force in their life for feeling secure and safe and uh, calm, you know? Yeah. When my kids ever came home from school and talked about like a teacher, you know, mm. being unfair or... You know, whatever it is, I always am like, really? Well, what what did she do? Wait, <laughs> what? And it's not like I think a lot of parents are worried that, you know, you're going to be modeling for your kids that, that they can go and be rude or disrespectful to or the question. teacher. Like if you yeah. val yeah or question like if your kid comes home and is telling you something happened or the teacher was in a bad mood or they yelled at them, you know, or, you know, did some things that, that were not okay or, or graded their tests too harshly or whatever it is, right. like you just have their back and believe them. That doesn't mean you go and fight the battle for them. That's, that's like, right. It's enough, right? It's enough just to be like, ugh, you're just right. like with them in it. And it's amazing what happens. Like I've always handled it like that. And I've, I really, well, Alec may have at times, especially in high school when he was like teenager -y and rebellious, if he felt like a teacher was really in the wrong, I think he probably <laughs> mouthed off a little bit, but they would never think to go and show disrespect because it's like, right. 
it's it's just there's something about having each other's backs that just makes people right. feel supported and confident and and able to figure it out. It doesn't That's teach right. them to go and be rude and and have disrespectful yeah. behavior to other people because they feel so respected at home. No, it's just like, look, you've got a problem. We're going to we're going to figure it out together. That is exactly right. It doesn't mean you go and you fix it. It's just that you're telling the kid like I've got your back. I'm going to, I'm here. We're going to, we, you know, this is your job as a parent to help them figure it out. <laughs> you know, And I think you can teach the, the older siblings to do that for the younger siblings. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's just like you said, like when the baby comes, it's like, it can be an exciting time for the other kids. Cause it's like, now you have all these responsibility. Kids love responsibility, younger kids. Right. I don't know about teenagers, but I think they do too. Actually, there's a book coming out about how they want, they want responsibility and purpose. And, um, but you know, it's like, you, this is exciting. You've got all this new responsibility to do, to help and take care. And you, you're the role model now and, and you're the one they look up to. And, and so you can, you can start this as they get older, a lot of that then is like helping them solve problems, you know, helping them figure out their friends. And and so I, it, it, that's why I'm saying like it trickles down from the parents, right? It's like, I've got your back and you've got your little brother's back and, you know, we're, we're all, we're, we're all working together. And, and it's like, I'm going to be here for you no matter what. And I'm going to trust you, like you said, and I'm going to believe you, you know, even more than than some outside stranger, you know, it doesn't mean I mean or whatever right. to the stranger, but it just means like I'm on your team, and and, and we're gonna we're gonna get this done together. You know, I'm gonna help you. Well, think about it. It's it's kind of crazy. It's like if your kid comes home and complains about another kid or com- or or vents to you about something crummy that happened to them that day, whether it was a a friend or a teacher or someone else, how often as parents in our weird culture, are we taking that opportunity to try to teach them something or point out what the other person's perspective might be or poke holes? It's sort of like this like systemic gaslighting Yeah, undermining, right? I don't, I don't really understand it. That's how my parents were too. And then there was also this like playing off each other, like me and my sister, which I, which I just is so toxic, right? Like, like one, one parent would talk bad about the other kid, the other sibling with, you know, with each other. So it wasn't even just gaslighting from a stranger. It was like gaslighting within our family, you know, it was so yeah. toxic. And I came and from like, that too. Yeah. Oh, it's awful. Like you're totally undermining this team foundational thing that we're talking about, right? Thanks for listening today, guys. I hope you picked up some tips, tools, maybe some baby steps for creating more balance and boundaries in your life. And I just wanted to let you know, if you want to continue moving the needle forward in creating this for yourself, having a happier household, I want you to go to my website and check out mastermindparenting.com. We have three beginning programs, and if you need some accountability and more support, then please look for the one that would be a good fit for you. Um, And as always, we're on all the social channels under Mastermind Parenting. On Instagram, it's Mastermind underscore Parenting. Um, And, you know, periodically, I do pop up on different Instagram lives, Facebook lives, where I give you teaching and coaching, and I love engaging with you live to help you help your strong-willed kids so that they can feel better, because when they feel better, they do better. And um, I love, love, love getting to know you guys. So thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Super, super appreciative.